Let's work through another uh, problem set, developing some more of the theory of the exterior derivative and the, ex the exterior product, the wedge product of differential forms. Um, let's go ahead and nail down and, and prove the general rule for the for the for products for the derivative of a product. This is what we had guessed last time, that the derivative of, of obeys something like the usual product rule, but with a funky sign here. And let me introduce a notation. I can't remember if we've done this in these videos so far. Um, when alpha is a p form, we could just name that by p, but it's kind of nice to not have to say this every time, if alpha is a p form then. And we have this notation, to borrow the absolute value bar notation, and just say, um, put a little absolute value bar alpha. That's not in any sense the size of alpha. There are other notions of the size of a form, like the magnitude of a form. Um, but it's just a convenient notation for that. It's, it's very rare that there'd be any confusion. Okay, so the first thing I'd like, I want to claim that even though we're doing this in general, we can assume there's something a bit specific about this. That alpha is just a function times some product of individual basis one forms. Now, let's look at these double subscripts. Those can kind of make your eyes glaze over sometimes. I need to be able to have any variable for the first one, any variable for the second, any variable all the way up to the pth. And so I need to pick out integers i1 through ip and then make those the subscripts of the x's. So we're, we're all working on, this is in rn, and so we're going to go from x1 to xn are the variables, but we don't want just x1 through xn here. It's supposed to be some selection of those. Similarly, I'm going to have j1 through jq be q integers, and then I'm going to pick those integers to be the variables that we're talking about here. So double subscripts are something that you have to get used to when you prove this kind of stuff in general. So why can we assume that it's not just it's not a sum of these guys with different dx's, but why is it just an, an individual one? Think about that for a second. I want to pause the video because I'm going to give the answer. And um, it's just because d and the wedge product are linear. Um, that if this were, if alpha were a sum of a bunch of stuff, and beta were a sum of a bunch of stuff, I'd just get a big sum of all kinds of individual stuff, and if it works on, if this rule works on each individual term, then it would work in general. So that's a nice thing to, we, it gets us out of um, having to do a lot of notational tricks and summations and stuff like that. So here's, I've done a lot of the derivation here, but minus the crucial steps. We start with d of a product of wedge product of these kinds of forms. Um, when I take the product, remember the, the functions, I could actually put a wedge in here if I wanted to. It's totally legal. But because these guys are zero forms, they're just functions, they can be commuted at will through everything. And I'm just going to put them in front. And that's exactly the kind of way I want to write something when I want to take d of it. Our rule is d of function times a product of basis one forms is just d of that function and then wedge all the stuff. So now we can just expand out the, the definition of d. So let's just copy this stuff down. And then this is going to be the sum. So here's where a summation comes in of the partials of the product pq with respect to, oops, rather kind of d, with respect to all the different variables. That's x, k. So this is something that can be a little hard, a, a st stumbling block for people at this uh, when you're not used to it, is this involves a summation over all the variables. And we've been used to doing like x, y, z all the time, but that becomes a summation. That's going to have a new little index, a new letter of k here, and um, I'm going to get a summation like this, and then wedge, oops, very crucial, wedge dxk. So this thing here is the expansion of dpq. Now, one thing to notice, oh, I forgot to say already, uh, when I wedged alpha and beta together, there's a fairly good chance that maybe some of these i's and some of these j's, uh, one of these indices and one of these indices could be equal. In which case, you could commute them to put them together, and then it would all be zero. So it's a nice thing that we don't actually have to worry about that as a special case. If this is all zero, it's OK. The, the other side's going to be zero as well. We never actually have to worry about that. Similarly, the dxk could well collide with one of these indices, and it could give us zero but that's not going to be some special case we have to deal with separately. OK, now we're where we want to be for product rules. We've actually got the derivative acting on a function, and we know there's a product rule for functions. And that's where this is all is going to come from. OK, so now I'm going to replace this, let's see, with dpqdxk. 
dxk times dp dxk times q, but then plus, and let me just kind of copy and paste some stuff around here. Now notice I'm not changing the order of the p and q. That's just by good habit. It I could have put the p over here, um, but you tend to not want to change the order of anything here unless you really have to, because when it, with the one forms it really really does matter what the order is. Okay, so what's the goal here? I'm trying to get to d alpha which beta plus or minus alpha which d beta. d alpha is stuff where the p is being differentiated. d beta is stuff where the q is being differentiated. And so I want to get this part completely separate from this part. Okay, that's not too hard. It's just going to be two big summations. So I'm going to just copy this and paste it twice. And then I'm just going to delete. Let's see here. I'm just going to delete this. And I don't need the parentheses. And here I'm going to delete this. And I don't need the parentheses. Okay, so let's see what's going on here. Well, the Q, I could actually move into place. It actually wants to go over and be with its pals, the DXJs, because this is exactly beta. Okay, that's cool. And now what is this? Hey, that's exactly this here, the summation right to here, that's DP. Okay, so I'm just going to write as DP. Wedge uh, all the rest of the XIs, good. Wedge this stuff. Okay, that's going to be turn into d alpha wedge beta. So that's all set. Okay. Um, so the only thing that had to get moved back in place was a function. That's a zero form. It commutes with everything. Um, but in this one, look what's happening. The d at q dx k dx k, the sum of partial q partial x k wedge dx k, that summation without the p in it. That's exactly d, dq, but I want that to be with its friends over here with the dxjs. Ooh, okay. Well, this the summation, that's fine. It just can stay out there. The p's in the right place. The function doesn't matter, but the dxk is going to have to be um, moved over to write in this slot, and it's going to have to commute past exactly p other one forms. That's why we get a minus 1 to the p, times all this stuff, which is basically alpha. And then D, I'm just going to collapse this sum of dq, dxk, dxk into dq. And to put it in the, in the right place, I get a minus 1 of the p. And so this is just d alpha which beta plus minus 1 of the p alpha which d beta. And so it's, the, this, it's really this step right here to here that is where that minus 1 is coming from. It's all about the fact that order really matters for these guys because of the, the anti-symmetry. OK, so next problem. Let me let you look at it for a sec here. Go ahead and pause the video if you want. It's about d squared being 0. And we want to show that not just for functions, but forms in general. So let's warm up with uh, an explicit case, and then we'll get to stuff with lots of summations. Um, in R4, to give us enough room, I want to take a 2 form and take d of it twice. If I was in R3, think about this for a second. Why would that be uninteresting in R3? This is a 4 form, wherever it would be defined. And a 4 form in R3 is, is 0 just for algebraic reasons, nothing to do with calculus. So let's do it. go ahead and do it in R4 with w, x, y, z being the variables. OK, so let's look at this. Taking d twice. OK, well, let's just work it out from the inside out. I know how to take d of a, f a function times a uh, basis 2 form. That's just going to be dp wedge dw wedge dy. OK. And now, hmm, well, there's a couple ways to do it. I could go ahead and expand the dp out right now. It's a little more clever to actually use the Leibniz rule that we just did, the product rule that we just did. So that's d of dp alone, wedge all that stuff, wedge the dx plus dy. And then minus, because this is a one form, dp left alone, wedge d of the rest of it. So I'm using this as one form is out al the alpha is dp and the beta is this guy. Okay. Now this part is really easy. This is just one dw wedge dy. Our rule for d of a constant basis one form uh, two form is just zero. So that's just going to be zero. And now I'm back to just d of d of a function. Okay. That's not too bad. So um, all I need to show is explicitly, which is something we already pretty much know, is that d of d of a function is equal to zero. And, but I'll go ahead and do it out. So I'm just going to drop this because we know that's 0. And then this is going to hang on for the ride. But let's just go ahead and do this. Now in R4, dp 
is going to be, um, I'm going to use the subscript notation because it's faster to write out, pwdw plus, oh, it's, I'm even going to be faster if I copy and paste a little bit. Okay, pwdw plus px dx plus py dy plus pz dz. And then I'll wedge dw dy. And then the other part was zero already. Okay, so now I'm going to get d of pw, d of px. Okay, so that's going to expand out a little bit. That's the price I pay for being really explicit and not using summation signs. Okay. But it shouldn't be too bad. Um, and uh, the nice thing is, now I can't, right here, I couldn't actually say, oh, wait, I don't have to write the dy because there's a dy here. Uh, because I I'm have yet to take a d, so that would have been a little premature. But now I'm going to take, like here, d of pw dw, just this part. d of a function, I'm going to get derivatives of like pwx, things like that. and the thing is, if they have a dw in them, which this already has, or a dy in them, I know they're going to die against the dw dy. Okay, so now I'm going to start just not writing everything. So this one is going to have a dw in it no matter what I do, because it's already got a dw, and then taking the d of this thing is just going to introduce more stuff. So that is really going to die. Okay, and the dy here is going to die. So I'm just going to ignore those puppies. The d of px, well, I'm only going to have to take p sub x z dx. Because if I took uh, dw, if I, put, if I took dx, it would produce a dx that would kill this guy. If I took a dw, it would kill against this guy. And if I put a y, it would kill against this guy. So there's actually not that many terms here. dx, sorry, dz wedge dx, and that's part of this parentheses, building that up, plus, okay, let's see, anything else, um, this is already going to die, pz dz, that could live, but only if the derivative I take is a pzx, and then a dx wedge dz. And then all d wedge dy, dw dy. Aha. Okay. Now, if you aren't so efficient in doing this and you end up expanding it out into 16 terms, you'll, you'll pretty quickly see that a lot of it dies. Now, here's the key. I've got pxz, derivative with respect to x and then z, and p with respect to, derivative with respect to z and then x. Those are the same quantity. But dz wedge dx and dx wedge dz are opposite to each other. And so this is going to be equal to 0. I just express this as a minus and then just change the order here. And I'm done. Okay. So as I've said before, the key is Clairaut's theorem, the symmetry of partial derivatives, the key commutation, and then the anti-commutivity or the anti-symmetry of the one form wedge products. Okay. So now let's do the general case. Let's look at p being just a function times some selection of the dx's. By linearity, we only have to do that. And I want to take d of d alpha. So let's do that. That's d of d of. So this is a good place to pause the video if you want to do it yourself. OK. I know what d of a function is, or d of, of a function times basis 1 forms. I'm not going to worry about the outer d yet. That's going to be dp wedge, all this stuff. And now um, I could either be kind of clever and do the. Um, the Leibniz rule, or it really doesn't help a lot when you're doing this generality, so I'm not going to try to be too clever about it. I'm just going to say, let's expand out the dp. Okay, so that's this guy. I bring in some new uh, index, a new dummy variable, k, to run through all the variables, and there's the dp expanded. That's all I did in this step. Okay, now d of a sum is the sum of the d's, so I'm going to be able to take the sum out here, and then I've got d of function times uh, a wedge of one forms. Oh, OK. I know how to do that. I'm going to take all the partial derivatives of this guy with respect to all the different variables. Oh, boy. I need another sum with another variable. And I'm going to get second derivatives. Surprise, surprise. That's what I was getting here. And here I'm writing them with the, the um, round d notation, just to be different. 
And I'm going to take the x derivative, and I'm going to be taking the the l derivative. And I didn't do that right. OK. So this already had dxk, but the new dx that I'm bringing in is all these different xls. So I'm going to get a dxl. And then wedge all the stuff that was already there, including the dxk. OK, so you might want to stop a second, think about how all I did was I took d of each one of these functions. The k you want to think of as just a fixed index for a second. But because I'm taking d of that, I do another summation over all the of all, all a new choice of all the variables x1 through xn, and I get second derivatives times this new dx's that I'm bringing in, wedge the old ones that came from the previous application of d, wedge all the other ones that came because it act, they actually were part of alpha in the first place. Okay, and oh, and of course that's just exactly what I had here. Okay, so I don't need that. Okay, so now. Can we, I claim that that's zero. That's just zero. Let's see why. Well, first of all, these guys are not actually doing anything interesting. It's all happening in here. And look, look at what's happening. There's various ways of being explicit about this. What, what usually people say is just that, look, the xk and the xl, these derivatives commute. So for any pair, k and l, I'm going to get this twice. And I'm going to get this combination in each of them in opposite order. So they're going to cancel in pairs and die. Okay. If you wanted to be more explicit about it, you could do something like this. You could look at where the sum, where the k is less than l of these guys, and then I could then set, and then I could also look at the sum where the k is greater than l. Where k equals l, I'm going to get dx k wedge dx k. That already is dead. That's that's uh, nice to know. Okay. And all of this is still, whoops, is still wedge these guys. Well, oh, that's kind of getting big. But those aren't doing anything interesting. And then I can just take this expression, take this copy it one more time. I keep doing that. Um, control C, I'm going to press down the control key a little harder. And then I can just go ahead and purposely change this. So here's stuff where k is less than l. So the smaller index is, is is after the bigger index. And I'm just going to switch the k and l here. Okay, So I'm just going to switch these guys. Dummy variable doesn't matter. I'm just going to everywhere switch this guy. Um, l greater than k. Um, oh, actually, no. Let's Sorry. Let's do it this way. There's a couple of ways to do this. And I just changed my mind in the middle. I know that's not, not good for a video. Um, I'm just going to use the anti-commutativity of this guy. Here we go. Minus. OK. K. And L. So I'm really using something interesting about one forms here. I'm actually switching these guys. I'm not relabeling the indices right now. OK. But let's look at what's happening here. OK. Um, I've got, now I've got stuff where the L, which is supposed to be the smaller index, is later. Hey, that's exactly what was going on here. Here k is the smaller index, and that's later. Now I'm going to relabel the index, indices. I'm just going to switch everywhere I see an L with a k. The names don't matter. It's a very standard trick with uh, summations. That was a relabel step. And now these things look identical. Okay. And L greater than k, that's the same thing as k less than L. This is definitely equal to this, and it's equal to 0. So that's just a little bit more explicit. Um, but the, the usual argument is simply these are symmetric, these are anti-symmetric, they cancel in pairs. Here's how the pairs cancel if you want to see it more, ex more explicitly. OK, well, I'll, I'll stop the video right now.